Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the visual aid requirement for this speech. Um, okay, so everybody will be using a visual aid. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about visual aids and the information I'm going to provide you um, will be a little bit adapted. So I'm providing information assuming that you are presenting a speech in front of a live audience. All right, so obviously, um, so I'm going to present that information that way, but then I'll make some adjustments when we're talking about camera stuff. <clears throat> okay, so visual aid, we talked last time about, um, or in the first video, the most important thing to think of when you're using a visual aid is, does this visual aid add new information that's above and beyond what the audience could get just by listening to me say the speech? Okay, so you want to add new information. And so I just want to make one quick caveat here. So the quiz that you take for Friday, chapters three through five, does not have any short answer questions. It's just questions from your book. But the next quiz, chapter six, seven, and eight, that will be due next Friday, that will have questions from this lecture and from the next lecture on um, organizing the how-to speech. And so one question might be, um, what's the most important thing to think about when deciding if you need a visual aid or not, okay? So the point is you don't just want to throw in visual aids just for the purpose of having visual aids. If it adds something to your speech, and, and sometimes it's just adding interest or adding um, excitement or that type of thing, but you don't want to have a visual aid that adds nothing, okay? And so, you know, we're kind of in a PowerPoint culture right now, and so it's, it's a lot of times it's expected to have a PowerPoint. A lot of PowerPoints are really, really crappy. Okay, they're really sucky as far as presentation aids. They don't add a lot of new information that the person who's talking d doesn't talk about. They're usually poorly constructed in the sense that they have so many words on them or they just have a bunch of pictures that are distracting. They don't really go with what the person's talking about. So PowerPoints, unless they're done really well, are usually more of a distraction than a help. Well, that's a pretty broad statement. I don't know if I want to go that far, but you know, just be considerate when you're thinking about whether to use a visual aid or not and what type of visual aid to use. Okay, so um, let's talk about some different types of visual aids. So for this speech, you're going to be using a visual aid. Now your visual aid can be an object, <clears throat> okay? It can be, your visual aid can be yourself. So if you're teaching us how to do yoga, maybe your speech is how to do yoga and you're teaching us three different yoga poses. Well, Probably for that type of thing, you won't need anything else but yourself as a visual aid. Okay. Um, so for this speech, when I'm talking about visual aid, I mean some sort of tool that you use to visually demonstrate what you're talking about. You want to make sure that your visual aid, that you have stuff already kind of prepared out. And I always tell students to think about like cooking shows when it comes to this. On the cooking shows, they already have all the stuff like measured out for them, right? They already have the stuff prepped or they go to the oven and, oh, look, this is already cooked, that type of thing. So that works really well. And the same thing can work well for your visual aids. And I'll give a couple examples of speeches that students have done. Um, one is, well, probably the best example is, um, and this usually happens in the fall semester, but I'll get a few students usually every year that do how to carve a pumpkin. Okay. Now you could teach us how to carve a pumpkin by bringing a brand new pumpkin into class and cutting the top off and scooping all the guts out and then drawing the face on and then cutting the things out. But what we find is when you do it that way, it takes a lot longer. There's a lot of dead space. You know, it's hard to be cutting intricate things and trying to um, think about what you're going to say, that type of thing. So what tends to work a lot better in a situation like that is if a student comes in and they already have everything carved, okay, but then they put like the eyes back into the pumpkin. So it looks like it's a full pumpkin, right? Um, and so then they can pretend to cut 
and then pull the eyes out. But then it, it goes really quick, if that makes sense. Or like a tie-dye type thing, if students have done how to tie-dye t-shirts. It can get really messy if you're in there actually dunking things and tie-dyeing things right in the classroom. What tends to work a lot better is having one like having different shirts and then one where it's a normal t-shirt, one where you started to tie the rubber bands already, one where it's already been dyed and dried and stuff before you take it open. You know what I mean? And then you can cut it open and show the class, that type of thing. But having a different shirt at each step of the process, instead of trying to actually go through the process seems to work a lot better. So think about that when you're doing this. Um, and again, there's a lot more flexibility here because you can go outside to throw your baseball or you can cook in your kitchen, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you can fix your car like in your garage. So um, you are going to have some more flexibility, which is nice when it comes to these sorts of things. But again, it's a good idea to have things that are kind of pre-made or pre-set out for different stages of it than trying to demonstrate the whole thing. And if you are doing stuff where like, if you're cutting out the pumpkin eyes, that type of thing, then make sure you have something to say. You don't want to have a lot of dead space. One mistake that students make a lot is having a lot of, I call it dead space or dead air while they're doing whatever instead of talking. So you should be talking your way through. Um, you know, if you're making um, an art project, be talking about, you know, okay, we're going to draw like this. And while you're demonstrating it, be talking about you're using charcoal and what is charcoal, like what are the benefits of using charcoal versus a pencil or something like that. Okay. Um, you won't worry about it this time, but if you were in an audience, one thing that you want to kind of think about as far as visual aids are passing things around. It's generally not a good idea to pass something around during your speech. The best time to pass something out is after your speech. Uh, if you pass something out before your speech, a lot of times, People might be paying attention to whatever you passed out beforehand, but sometimes it's necessary. But if you pass things out or around during your speech, so I've had students that have done, you know, here's how to make a scrapbook, and they'll pass a scrapbook around to the audience while they're giving their speech. And the problem with that, as you can imagine, is that people are not paying attention then. So first of all, there's the distraction of the passing. And you know in a classroom, if you're passing something around, people have to pass up to different rows or shapes, blah, 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 that type of thing. But then also when the person gets the scrapbook, they're not paying attention because they're looking through the scrapbook. So um, passing things around usually is not a great idea. Again, won't be a problem in this one, right? Um, so I think for this, um, so again, you want to make sure just in general that your visual aids are neat and organized and not sloppy, that they're presented well, that they look nice, that, that those types of things. If you want to use like a PowerPoint or an Elmo, or the Elmo, and the Elmo is that camera in the classrooms where if a teacher puts like a piece of paper on it, it puts it up on the, on the screen. Um, those probably aren't necessary now. Like a lot of times I'll tell students to use um, the Elmo if they're like doing something really small, like they're painting their nails or something. But in this situation, you might, you'll probably be able to maneuver your camera in a way where you can show us that type of thing. Now that said, I don't want to just see the visual aid. If, if it makes sense, you know, if you're showing me how to paint a flower on my nail, and for that time, you just have it on there. But then the camera should be on you the rest of the time. Okay. I want to see you talking and that type of thing. Um, but just in general, if you're using a PowerPoint sometime, and again, a PowerPoint in, in the classroom, PowerPoints are good for this type of speech sometimes. Like if you're showing a recipe or if you're, you know, showing the different parts of a car you know, in pictures or whatever, I might recommend a PowerPoint. But again, for this, there's no reason for you to take pictures of your car and show pictures on your, like go out to the car, go out to your bike and change the tire if that's what you're doing or whatever. Like it just makes sense for you to actually be with, you know, in the kitchen baking when you're giving the speech or whatever. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that your visual aids aren't distracting to your message and distraction can happen with noise. So it can be um, a visual aid that 
sorry. My dog gets me every time. Okay, it can be a visual aid, speaking of distracting with noise, that makes too much noise. So if you're like wrapping a present in cellophane and it's like, and we can't hear you talking over that, um, that can be a problem. Or if it is um, visually distracting, so you don't necessarily want to have your visual aids up the whole time you're presenting. Uh, you might want to just show them when it's appropriate and then put them down. Again, dangerous, inappropriate visual aids, like let's just stay away from that. We're not at school right now. So again, you know, usually if we're at school, I say don't bring in big knives if you're doing a cooking demonstration, right? But you know, you're at home now. So if you're in your kitchen and you want to use a knife, great. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit um, different for this situation. I usually recommend not to use live things, things that are alive in your presentation. So again, um, demonstrating how to change a diaper on a baby, okay, or how to teach your dog to sit or whatever, those things. And again, in this situation, because you're videotaping your speech, it might be okay because if you mess up, I don't know if you guys have been watching Jimmy Fallon doing his show with his kids and different takes of that. Um, but if you mess up, then you can go back and, you know, if your baby starts crying or if your dog starts acting crazy, you can go back and retape it. But um, in like bringing a baby to a classroom has, or a dog, people bring their dogs all the time. Like it just, I've never seen it work out really well. <laughs> it just, it just seems to go awry. Okay. Um, and that's the other thing that I like to let people know as far as, um, you know, inappropriate or that type of thing. Again, for this speech, you're going to be in your own home. So this isn't going to be a concern, but you really also, you always want to be thinking about your audience when you're constructing your speech in all the different aspects of it. And visual aid is not um, different in that regard. So if let's say you were making a recipe and you brought in the recipe for your audience to taste, you'd want to make sure that you knew what was in it in case anybody had allergies or, you know, they couldn't have gluten or they were a vegetarian or whatever. You'd also want to make sure that um, people felt comfortable. Like I had a girl who talked about caring for her pet snake as part of her how-to speech and she brought in her snake and stuff. And, um, but she talked about feeding the snake and showed like the rat that she, or it's not a rat, I guess it's a mouse, but like showed that in the class. And even though people were kind of like, okay, you can bring your snake, that's fine. But watching a snake eat a mouse is not fine for some people. You know what I mean? So that was like too far. Or I've had students who have demonstrated like giving themselves shots as some sort of demonstration and people like getting woozy and passing out in class because they can't watch a needle go into an arm because that's something that is hard for people. So even if it's something that it seems like totally normal to you, you also want to keep your audience in mind. Now, again, for these speeches, I have pretty thick skin. Like, I mean, I could imagine some things that you could do that I wouldn't want to see, but those would be inappropriate in a lot of other ways. So for the most part, you have pretty free reign, but keep your audience in mind all the time because something that might seem natural or normal to you might not be okay for other people in the audience. Okay. And the other thing that you want to make sure, and this one might be tricky with the camera, is you want to make sure that we can see your visual aid. So you, that's going to um, affect the lighting. You want to make sure the lighting in the room that you are speaking in is good and the lighting on your camera works well. And then also you want to make sure that, you know, I should be able to tell what visual aid you're using. I should be able to tell what's happening um, and again, it should provide me new information that I couldn't get just by listening. Okay, so these are some kind of general tips for using visual aids. Um, it is a requirement in this speech. It's a big requirement. It's like 25 of the points. So just having a visual aid and following these guidelines, it's going to earn you 25 points for this speech. Again, remember, 20 points, I think, sorry. But it's 20 points out of 130 points, 135 points or whatever is pretty big. So, but just remember the most important thing when using a visual aid is that it adds new information that the speaker couldn't get just by listening. So it should enhance your speech 
and add new things to your speech that it would be hard or difficult to do um, just by listening. And again, think about the yoga example that we talked about. I could say, okay, well, in a downward dog, lay down on the ground facing forward and do, do you know what I mean? I could describe how to do the yoga position. That is not going to give an explanation or like, what's a dance craze? That, like one of those TikTok dances. Think about those. I'm so old guys. Think about one of those TikTok dances that people are doing. You could describe, okay, you do two kicks and then you pump, well, and then you pump your hand twice and blah, blah, blah. Or that's going to be really hard for somebody to understand. But of showing you do that, that's going to be a lot easier to understand if you're, okay, first you do this, then you do this, and you're actually doing it along with it. That's going to make it much clearer to your audience than trying to describe the dance move to your audience. Okay. So make sure your visual aid adds new information to your speech that the audience wouldn't get just by listening. And then make sure it's neat and nice and organized and all the other things we talked about. Okay, one more video coming after this, and it's going to be about the format of the how-to speech. All right, good luck.